Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this event. Today, we're going to talk about the triple planetary crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. I'm your moderator for today, at least for the first half. On the second half, I will give it to Ida. Uh, my name is Wouter Ubink. I'm a UN Youth Representative on Biodiversity and Food. And I have the honor today to introduce you to our first two speakers. And our first speaker is Inger Anderson, the executive, uh, sorry, the um, executive director of the United Nations Environment Program. Please give her a very warm welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. And great uh, opportunity to be here in beautiful, beautiful Netherlands. And thank you to the UN Youth Organization and of course to Idlu for, Idlu for hosting. And what I want to say today as we're discussing the triple planetary crisis is this, and Greta said it before me, but the house really is on fire. And when we're seeing mudslides, when we're seeing fires, when we're seeing droughts, when we're seeing inundations in places we're not supposed to see them, we should be concerned. When we are seeing ecosystems collapse, when we are seeing birds and fish appear in places they don't belong, we should be concerned. And we are concerned because 90% of young people say in general surveys that they are worried about climate, that they are worried about the future, and that they want answers, they want action. And so for me, as the head of the United Nations Environment Program, having an opportunity to meet here today young people and hear the voices, hear the demands. You know, young people tell me nothing about us without us, but this whole world is about the next generation. So I very much look forward to this conversation and thank you so much, Varda, for hosting. Thank you. Thank you again. I really appreciate the urgency. Thank my you. Please. My pleasure. Then I now introduce the second speaker for today, um, who is uh, Mert Kumru of the World Youth for, uh, World Youth climate justice. Uh, for Climate Justice. <laughs> Thank Mert. you, Walter. Um, I think it's very good to put it in perspective. When we talk about the climate crisis, when we talk about the climate in changing, what does it mean? Um, some think of forest fires, other, things, other people could think of rising sea levels. But the climate change crisis, or the climate crisis, so to say, is nothing more than a human rights crisis. And the fact that we're currently trying to bring the world's biggest problem to the world's highest court is only because we want to protect one thing. Besides our planet, we want to protect our human rights. The planet will survive regardless from us being there. But our human rights are the only things that we can tangibly hold on to and protect together. A friend of mine, Vishal, is from Fiji. He's one of our steering members and I had the honor to welcome him for the first time to the Netherlands. Regardless from all of the visa problems for people from Fiji and from the Pacific in general, he managed to come here. And the first thing that we said to each other was, we are connected and at the same time also disconnected by one thing. Our connection is the ocean. We both live surrounded by water, sometimes even underwater. That connection is far away is also threatening us because we both know that if these sea levels rise, our lives, our families will disappear. And for him, that's actually a thing that he can pinpoint. He can point to lands, to peoples that have disappeared over time due to our acts and omissions. And today here, I would like to provide you with an insight on how we think we can change this narrative, how we think we can change the current path we're on. We're trying to use the final legal tool that we have within this toolbox of, of opportunities and solutions to seek climate justice at the world's highest court. And climate justice can come in many forms. Some could take the streets. We also take the streets sometimes. But you can also talk to those who are making these decisions, those who are in those seats of power. And in, an, in, a, in a way, there is not that much different from us compared to young people from the Pacific. We both have dreams, we both have goals, we both have ideas and ideals on how to form and shape the planet. But when we talk about 1.5, we think that that's the solution, that's the end goal. But 1.5 is just for them to survive, not to thrive. And right now, we're heading towards 2.7 degrees. Imagine the impacts on their lives, on their families, we're not even giving them the opportunity to think about a future generation because their own current generations are being threatened. So I hope that today 
um, we could give you some more insights on ways to make sure that future generations are at the core of policy making and that young people can be included in these processes. We're not enemies, we're not foes, we're friends. And sometimes friends need to be very honest with each other. And I hope today that we can have a very honest conversation. I'm looking very much forward to it. Thank you, Walter. Thanks very much, Matt. <laughs> All right, everyone. We will now move on to a short panel. We have some questions prepared for Inger and Mert. Um, and after that, we are going to take your questions uh, from the audience and also from the audience online. So please uh, have those ready in uh, a few minutes. Uh, we'll now move on to the short panel. Thanks. May I invite uh, Inger and Mert uh, on the podium again? Thanks. Inger and Mert, very nice uh, to have you both here. Um, I actually, my first question is uh, if you have any questions for each other. Maybe, Inger, you have a question for one of the youth advocates. I do, because you and I were just chatting, Mert, and um, one of the things that you were saying is that um, you're very seized with the, with the uh, General Assembly's ask for a legal opinion uh, on climate change, uh, which we know has been accepted by the International Court of Justice. And so this is like a big move by the General Assembly and a big move for all things legal. and. And uh, I just wondered, we are even, we're sitting here in Idlu, um, for your reflections on that, and w what do you think needs to happen, and who needs to opine? Uh, that would be really interesting for us to talk about, I think. Sorry, that's a different question. That's a good question, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Inger, and um, I'm actually happy that you asked this question. I think you should become a campaigner for us as well. <laughs> um, well, right now, we're looking at uh, the position we're currently in is, is basically you should see it as follows. Countries are the ones that can ask for an advisory opinion. And uh, only countries uh, that are part of the UNGA have that right. And back in 2019, we started our campaign by seeking for this advisory opinion uh, through Vanuatu. And Vanuatu is a small island state in the Pacific. It's uh, very being threatened by climate change within this generation. So that means that uh, people from, uh, well, seeing some young people <laughs> our age <laughs> will already suffer the consequences of climate change. Um, and when they, uh, when they saw us, when they heard the story from our Pacific Island friends who started this campaign, they said, okay, we believe in this campaign, we believe in your ideals, we're going to push this for you at the, at the international court. And just to give you an idea, back then, we only had one country aboard, and you need to have um, a majority, a simple majority at the UN. So that's 193 countries, and then 50% plus one. So that's a pretty big ask. <laughs> uh, and on the 29th of March of this year, we wrote history because 132 countries co-sponsored the resolution. And that means that there was not even a vote necessary because there was almost a two-third majority of countries co-sponsoring this. Um, and that's absolutely massive. Um, and right now we're in the second phase of the campaign, so to say. And in this phase, countries can send in their written submissions to the court. So imagine you're the Netherlands, right? And this is also directly targeting the Netherlands. <laughs> um, when we discuss climate change, we have very different troubles than, for example, um, Austria, which is a country that's landlocked. So it would be very interesting for the Netherlands, for example, to discuss problems that we have with rising sea levels, uh, which we could put in our written submissions. And every country has that right. So every country can put their own views and their own arguments in a written submission at the court and deposit it at the court. So right now we're in the phase to lobby as much support all around the world to get young people to also be a part of that process. Because it makes no sense to talk about intergenerational climate justice without having young people to be a part of those talks, of those discussions, and of those conversations. So right now, our main goal is to get our legal arguments as we have presented in the Youth Climate Justice Handbook, um, which is, can be found online as well. <laughs> in this bar, I'm <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> um, and also, to make, so we want to make sure that young people are a part of that process. I think that's a short answer. All right, thank you very much. Um, great to hear about this, uh, this initiative, uh, Mert. Um, so we have a, a few questions collected from youth, and therefore both of you. So the first question we have is, um, shifting production and consumption from animal protein towards plant proteins will substantially reduce 
uh, global warming, pollution, and biodiversity loss. Um, and what do you think is the most fruitful strategy to accelerate this uh, transition towards uh, another protein um, consumption and production pattern? So if I'm to start, so I guess I have to confess that I'm a lifelong vegetarian. I think I haven't eaten meat since I was 18 or something. But the point, uh, but that's neither here nor there. This is a personal choice because of the path that I decided to take in my life. And I was a young activist once and <laughs> made decisions about my pathway. But I'm not going to be on the barricades advocating for vegetarianism, but I am advocating for flexitarianism. If we all want a big old steak every night, uh, it just won't compute. And so, but, so we can't. Uh, but we also need to understand that there are countries where proteins are hard to come by, um, and there are communities uh, where uh, meat is an important part of a child's nutrition. Um, and uh, lacking that uh, protein uh, will, uh, and the inavailability of other proteins on the market uh, will make it uh, complex. So I think it's a wealthier countries where we have the, the wealth of choice, uh, because not everybody has that wealth. If you are an indigenous uh, tribe living off hunted and gathered stuff, you will eat what you will eat when it's available. And if you live in the high north, um, there is not anything that really grows there. That's where my people originally came from, some part of my, my family. They came from north of the polar circle. And so there is just a reality to this. However, as I said, we, we need to be more mindful around the choices we make, the footprint that we have, um, and uh, being, being mindful that there are, in fact, very different ways that we can get our proteins and beans and lentils and all these good stuff, nuts and so on, uh, are great and uh, completely available in, uh, in uh, the markets of the, 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 the global north. And then we need to understand that the footprint of you and I, if I were to live in this part of the world right now, I live in Kenya, so, but if I, when I one day return maybe, is just so much heavier. And so there's a special burden of those of us, or a special task or an opportunity, let's put it this way, not as a burden, for us to actually walk a little more lightly on the planet. And I think that's part of being awareness, but we being aware. But I think we also need to be very careful that we don't become preachy. And you know, people don't like to be preached to, but people love to go to an Indian restaurant. Uh, and have a fabulous vegetarian meal. And so let's promote um, some of those uh, meals and cultures and culinary traditions uh, that are super attractive and super healthy and super uh, good for us at the same time. All right, Matt? Um, yeah, thank you much, so much, Inger. And I think this is a very good point. We, you don't want to preach something, right? You want people to, to get nudged positively and get incentivized to do that. Um, and I think um, this this actually, when I was younger, um, sorry, my, my grandmother would always tell stories about when she was younger, that back in the day, meat was not on the menu every single day. It was just simply too expensive, first of all. Um, so they would have a flexitarian diet by default. That was their default diet. Um, and I think we should also look into the way in which our consumption patterns, especially in the West, I would say, has exponentially been centered around heavy red meats or animal proteins, uh, which also takes a lot of uh, available lands in Global South for, for feed and for animal fodder and all of those things. Um, so I think indeed nudging in a positive way uh, and also listening to young farmers, young ecological activists and um, indigenous peoples on how to maintain those lands and how to maintain um, their grounds is very important in this. I would say include them. Um, and I always use this example if you're not at the table, then you're on the menu. And in this case, it's literally the, that. So in that instance, include them, I would say. Okay, thank you very much. Both you. Um, so to follow up on that, I think you mentioned the footprint and you mentioned uh, something like overconsumption as well. Uh, in the new global biodiversity framework, overconsumption is also mentioned as something that should be uh, reduced. Um, so one of the questions we have is, is um, uh, which countries like the Netherlands have, have large negative uh, spillover effects abroad? Um, how can we reduce this national f ecological footprints that extend beyond our own, our own borders, our own territories? Well, I, think, I, I think what we need to be considering is, first of all, having a degree of awareness. 
It's like, uh, what do we teach the young, the little ones, right? I mean, what do we teach? Throw away culture, the linear, uh, linear, a kid doesn't know it's linear, but it is, right? Uh, here's your lunch, you can just throw the plastic container afterwards. Um, or, or so it starts very young, and it starts by a degree of ecological ed uh, education, just like you learn your ABCs. Surely it's important to learn to take care of planet Earth. And, and I mean from really young, because uh, children just get it. I mean, when you've had a chance, they will tell at home. They will hold everybody else to account. You can hear a little sort of terror toddler being the ecological warrior in the house, right? Which is just wonderful. Um, so I think f start with that, but obviously it's much more. It's also the regulatory settings that we can set. But now, right now, we at the UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program, which I'm privileged to, ho uh, to, to lead, uh, we are engaged in a negotiation to eliminate plastic pollution. And so, how do we do that? N yes, there is waste management, but let's begin at the beginning. Do we need all this stuff to be enveloped in plastic? We can probably eliminate so much of the single use, just right, take it right out. And so, and this is where governments come in, industrial innovation comes in. Today, we want everything to be liquid, our toothpaste, our whatever, everything has to come. Why do we want to ship water around in plastic tubes? Why not make it dry? So now there are toothpaste pills, you put it in the mouth, it all foams up and you can brush your teeth and it comes in a cardboard box. Yes! It, are my teeth, are my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it works. Um, and so, and you buy a d bamboo toothbrush and you're set to go. The, the point is that, and, and the same, I mean, I was speaking recently to some of these cosmetics CEOs. And they're saying, yeah, we're thinking about how can we make it in powder form, you mix it with water and, and you're good to go. I think we need to rethink. So the point about the linear economy, just where we m take, then we make, and then we just throw it away as garbage, got to come to an end. That's on the sort of material footprint and raw materials and waste side, but of course our carbon footprint too, uh, because that's very, very important. Most of us don't even know what our carbon footprint is. Um, the things we buy, the, the, what is the footprint of the things we consume, and of course our own carbon CO2 footprint. Getting much greater awareness, and then yes, investing in public transport, investing in reliable uh, trains, the, the kind of things that we need in a modern society. So that no, uh, and using in a country like here, uh, obviously uh, pedal power, but um, these kind of uh, levers, especially in the global north, can be very meaningful. Great answer. Thank you very much. Mert? Um, yeah, and I think also to, to add on that, um, yes, you need to definitely um, inspire and like start with, with talking about it. But also, our current economies are very much centered around fossil fuels. Um, and that is basically also the linear notion of, of uh, the, our economies. So. I always use this example. When I was in high school, we had a project in high school, and I'm not kidding right now. It was sponsored by the oil lobby. And we were asked by uh, an oil company, I will not name them and shame them, but you can figure it out, to create your own ideal, and I kid you not, oil production center. And it was called Oil in Oman, and we needed to like create an entire um, like location with a hydro cracker, and we had four key uh, subjects in the school that we needed to use for that, uh, maths, science uh, and economy, ec economics and uh, social sciences. So we needed to make the ideal uh, Saudi Aramco plant, basically. And if we did it well enough, we could receive an invitation to go to the head office to get an internship and to get an iPod shuffle back then. It was insane. And right now, when I suggest this to like, my, my peers, and they, they look at me like, how was that a thing? But that was only eight years ago, so I'm probably <laughs> already saying how old I am. But just to give you an idea, that notion of a linear economy with a focus on fossil fuels was very much alive back then. Right now, we need to change and allow for young people to be educated into a system and into a new economy in which their contributions will lead to the circularity, which you talked about before, uh, and also takes away the incentive for these companies and these organizations and governments to work together and to provide them with subsidies, for example. Uh, 
just a couple of hundred meters away, there's young people protesting uh, <laughs> every month by, by now uh, to stop the fossil fuel subsidies that the government is giving to them. And imagine if these subsidies are being spent on innovation for a circular economy, for young people to be part of that economy, to nudge them into a greener future. The sky is the limit, literally. So I think it's, um, it's, the, it's the old economy that is, that is currently in fear of how their business model is going to be deter deteriorating over time. Um, but the question is, what will we allow before deterioration of our planet or of their business model? Right. Thank you very much. So on the matter of carbon uh, and, and fossil fuel industry, um, uh, we got this, this question about climate change. Um, during the pre-summit on climate change in Bonn recently, countries could not agree upon an agenda item for a mitigation work program. Uh, considering recent studies, the global temperature rises uh, 0.2 degrees every decade, and uh, this, this makes rapid inter intervention uh, even more urgent than it already was. So um, what is needed to prioritize um, this on the political agenda internationally? Everything, every, absolutely everything. At this point, um, it was in Glasgow, we had a little fight over out or down, face out, face down. And then it was in Egypt where we couldn't even say the words, either this nor that. This is completely unacceptable. Um, the Secretary General of the United Nations is not mincing his words. We are living in an absolutely existential moment. Um, you quoted our numbers uh, that we are projecting that by 2100, when we take the national determined contributions, both the unconditional as well as the conditional, which means if you give us this money, we will also do this stuff. Then, so both, this one is quite contingent upon money. We project now that we will uh, reach, with when we add it all up, 2.7 to 2.8 degrees at 2100. 2.7 to 2.8 degrees, and we're living at 1.1 now. So this is just where all tools in the toolbox need to be taken out and used. And that, yes, go to court. And that, yes, demonstrate. And that, yes, choose your lifestyles. And that, yes, means the kind of jobs we make. And that, yes, means knowing and understanding the science. It's all of the above. And yes, voting and making sure that the political decision makers that we, after all, put into power, make the decisions that are right for us right now and for the next and the next generation. Because climate procrastination cannot continue. I'm old enough to have attended the single digit cops, right? <laughs> and I don't think anyone else here, but you know, when you have done that, and I will remember, that when they began to talk about adaptation, I go, hell no, we're not gonna adapt. Why on earth would we adapt when we know that we need to mitigate? We only need to adapt by 2025. You know, if we do, this is what we said back in, you know, 92, 93, point being that adaptation was a thing, was a function of failure. Because if we had mitigated in the 90s, year on year on year, as the projection said we should do, adaptation would not be a thing. Now, of course, I'm under barricades fighting for adaptation finance. Uh, I was recently in Malawi, and I don't know if you, and before that in Pakistan, and seeing this absolutely devastatingly awful impact on the poorest taking the hardest hit. So it is time. It is time, and what the next COP has to do is to, to, to deliver. But frankly, um, we also need to understand that we have other powers. Um, each one of us, however big or small, we have a little bank account. Whether it's five euros or, you know, five million, uh, you know, there is a bank account. Where does that investment go? Many of us, we start a government job, we will have a pension. Where's the pension being invested? Um, some of you, sooner or later, may take a loan to buy an apartment. The money and the apartment that you will eventually own, um, what, who, and, and the loan of the bank that you're taking, where does this money get invested? Know this about your own footprint. Because it's not just do I take the bus or the bike. It is more than that, and I think that knowledge will become absolutely critical. Meanwhile, for the climate side, 
we need to push, push and push. We cannot accept any more coal power plants. We cannot continue to be uh, hydrocarbon dependent. We need to make the money available for the global south so that they can make that shift. Malawi, 12% access to modern energy, 12%. What are they going to do? You have to offer Malawi a non-carbon solution, which means climate justice as well. But Mert, what do you think? <laughs> I mean, you already said the half of our title, climate justice, so that's good. Um, I think it's very important because uh, when you spoke about Bonn, um, I had the honor to be there two days uh, at, the f at the first week. Um, I was meeting with uh, our, I, I call them friends, our friends from um, the global, uh, the, from Yungo, the youth constituency of, of um, the UNFCCC, and uh, of the UN, I'm sorry. And we talked with them about um, their ideas on the mitigation not being a part, and it was so interesting to see because there were a couple of people as well that also attended the, the single digit COPs, and back then they also said that adaptation was their biggest fear because we've accepted a certain amount of deterioration. Right now, um, what we would say is as soon as we forget mitigation, it means that we're accepting the fact that people that we're basically accepting human rights failures and human rights uh, um, being unprotected at this point. So, um, and what we would like to push on this point is you can't talk about adaptation without having mitigation at the core of that. Because mitigation only makes, sh makes sure that adaptation can work in the first place. Because you can't adapt and adapt and adapt to an ever worsening climate, because that means that at a given point, even adaptation will not work. And what's the next step? What, what comes after adaptation? Acceptance? I don't know. I, I don't think so. So in order to have adaptation being functional, you need to have mitigation at the, at the beginning, I would say. And this is also why we were pushing and still are pushing within our uh, Youth Climate Justice Handbook that mitigation needs to be a part of policy making uh, of the highest polluter states. Uh, why? Well, first of all, if you do not include that in your own policies, for example, in your entire economies, then you're just outsourcing this, this, um, uh, th these emissions to, uh, to LEDCs, for example, or MEDCs, and basically making sure that you don't have that trouble in your own country. Um, so you need to allow for investments in other countries as well so that they can also join in in this uh, mitigation effort and make sure that it's a global shared um, agenda item. So at the next COP, this year's COP, I mean, um, it's also very interesting that because it's a it's basically the, the most fossil fuel COP we would ever, uh, are ever going to see, I hope. So our core task should be the focus on mitigation from day one. And without mitigation, you can't talk about adaptation. It's, um, I think it's like a communicating body of, of two uh, elements. And that's, we need to have that link uh, to be secured. Maybe we could just yes. add that it's nearly 80% of all CO2 that comes from just 20 economies, the G20. So if the G20 were to just say, okay, we got this, frankly, we're done. Responsibility. They have the biggest responsibility. You know, Vanuatu can do and be very, very amazing in going net zero, but it's not gonna do the trick. And so there is an added responsibility on these 20 biggest economies. And of course, those with the longest carbon trail has an even bigger responsibility, which is why the Secretary General has called for the, the OECD G20 countries and OECD economies to go net zero by 2040, to give space for those developing countries that have a harder time doing it. Uh, so we really need to see action. I would like to add one more tiny thing to that. Sure. Thank you. You're inspiring me. <laughs> um, Vanuatu always says is that the, the, the government of Vanuatu always uses this example, right? They say the fire started elsewhere, but we're the ones who are stuck in the smoke. And that's exactly the thing. And I want to put one thing out of the, I just want to kill one idea that I've heard so many times. In the Netherlands, people say, but we're such a tiny country. Why would our contribution be, be so massive on a global scale? Well, the thing is, we are home to so many countries, uh, companies, industries that have their pollution elsewhere. So if we are the root cause and if we, our contributions in our lifestyles are so, so luxurious as we have them right now, that means that our impact is way bigger than we actually think. So let's kill this idea that we are so tiny and so uninfluential in a way because it's, it's, it's just not the truth. The peoples that are actually 
powerless in terms of their mitigation, uh, for example, is Vanuatu. Like they only have 400,000 people. If they mitigate, which they already do, just to be clear, then on a global scale, exactly, it will not influence it that much. But if we, as a part of the G20, inspire other European countries and other Western countries and other big economies to do the same thing, and we create policies that enforce that, then we make that change. And then those figures that say that we only are like 0.1% of the global temperature rise cause does not make a sense. That, that, like, it will be not used as an argument anymore, I would say. And not to mention our historical outputs also are a thing to take into consideration. Just to add that, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. Um, so I have one more question uh, we collected from, uh, from young people and then uh, I will move on to the audience. Um, so uh, uh, we've talked about the responsibility of governments. We, I think we have all been at, at some negotiations uh, at the UN level, but of course many youth uh, are not there and they are thinking, what can I do uh, uh, to help uh, solve these crises? Um, and we have seen that, that youth are a group which is um, very good at going at taking to the street. Um, and one of the questions we received is, what role can, can activism play uh, in, in these fights? Oh, activism is critical. I mean, um, you know, let's be honest, um, the f climate sort of cadence of the cops was getting into a lull and then on crashed to the scene Fridays for the Future. And um, that was a rude awakening for some. Thank God for that. Right? I mean, um, and then I can just say I'm so sorry for the hate that those uh, activists uh, attract, which is completely unacceptable. And then those that came after, and after, and after. And so I think um, it, it, activism is absolutely critical. But activism is also then what you do, because at some point, you know, people will settle down, get married, move on. And then what do they do with their lifespan career? Is once upon a time I was an activist, but now I'm a corporate executive. <laughs> you know, so what do we do thereafter? And I think it's really important that in the life choices we make, and it doesn't matter whether you become, you know, they're good corporations doing interesting stuff, right? But in what you do, do you, are you part of, what do you do in your local community, in your mosque, your church, your youth activity center, whatever it is, wherever you live, whatever, in whatever country, how do you, how do you motivate, engage, inform locally? What do you do in the local government level? Do you get engaged? Do you vote? Do you campaign? Do you inform yourself about what's happening about your local politics at the national level and at the EU level? Because you all have these additional votes and don't lose them because they are super precious. It doesn't matter if you, it doesn't work if we are active and then we, we don't actually use that democratic right that has been given to us. That is so important and protect it, right? and be mindful of false flag information and de 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 denying of science. And then in your careers, you know, will you be part of some startup that does something really interesting and innovative in a clean path, green path towards the future? Will you be, part, will you be a lawyer that will be part of litigation and holding to account and holding society's feet to the fire on clean and green and sustainable? And will you enter a business, which is fine, don't get me wrong, that's what makes the world go around, jobs, opportunities, etc. But inside there, will you work on seeking the sustainable path for that business that you are now finding yourself in? These are all choices we have. But keep the fire in the belly. Because that is, after all, you know, you're never too old to be an activist. Look at David Attenborough. Look at Jane Goodall. Look at some of those amazing people that go before us. They are activists into their 90s. And I intend to follow in their footsteps <laughs> as best I can. I don't compare myself to them. But, you know, we can all continue down this path and not give up. It is absolutely critical. All right, thank you. It's amazing to... to exactly think about these these individuals right and we uh, call ourselves the stubborn optimists it's also on our bottles as you can see <laughs> um, and what we mean with stubborn optimism is basically we know that sometimes we can be a little bit pushy annoying about certain things we're stubborn in that but we know that in the end only because of our stubbornness for example like the fridays for future stubbornness as well 
if we only keep this idea of activism alive by pushing it, by pushing the narrative, by going on the streets, but also going in the boardrooms, in the, the UN General Assembly halls, only with our perseverance, we can change that narrative and we can change that future. So that's why we're always optimistic. There's no time for us to be um, negatively involved with our own feelings or ideas that we can't save it anymore. There is a thing to win and we can do it. We can still find this idealism within tons of people. I mean, look at the audience we have here today. You all came with the idea that you can actually contribute to something. And um, we love to call ourselves activists because being an activist also keeps you alive and makes you active as well. So it, 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 it feeds it, so to say. Uh, but we want to have governments and heads of state and diplomats to also call themselves activists. So that when they, for example, invite us, they don't, see, they don't say it's a government and activists. No, it's activists and activists. So how can you do that? By, for example, making sure that these young people and these stakeholders are a part of your delegations. When you go to a cop, for example, and you don't have young people in your delegations, what are you really doing at the COP? A COP is a conference about the future. Include the future in your policies. In such a, it's, it's such an easy concept, but it's still very difficult to, to grasp and to understand for a lot of governments, because the idea that they are threatened by our activism is the thing that holds their, hold, hold, is holding them back. Um, but. I can tell you with the utmost confidence that the people that I've met at COPS and at Bonds, at SBs and Bonn, are super constructive in what they can do, are smart. And people like you that are already a campaigner or already activists, for example, or want to become an activist, can do it by very simple and easy steps. You can start by reading information about what you could do, for example, on a local level. And for your local actions, you can inspire globally. You don't need to start out with charging the UN building or something like that. That's not the first step you need to do. I mean, uh, I think you're like, <laughs> especially not the one in the Nairobi, right? <laughs> but you can, for example, inspire your peers, your colleagues, your parents to talk to get, to talk about this topic, to mention it, to, for example, go to a local city council meeting to discuss it, to a local school board meeting. I'm just mentioning these little things can become larger effects. Um, so. In a way, activism sounds as a very big, terrifying career path or, <laughs> or solution, but it's actually something you can start in right now. If you go outside and you see something that is bugging you and you want to change that, that's the first step in activism, acknowledging that there's a problem and that's a problem that you want to solve and you want to challenge. That's the first step, I would say. And we would love to welcome you all as new stubborn optimists as well to our campaign. I'm just putting it out there. Um, so send us a DM if you think that you want to help us out because we really would love to have you on board. And we need everybody, right? Everybody. <laughs> right. All right. Thank you very much for this short talk. So we will now move on uh, to questions from the audience and also from online. Um, I'm going to thank you, Inger and Mert as well, uh, for this conversation. And I'm going to give the moderation to Ida Simonsen, UN Youth Representative on Biodiversity and Foods. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Wouter, for your wonderful uh, moderation. And thanks to our speakers for your incredible contributions, your insights. I think the quality of which is really not just determined by the rhetorical flourish that you both have, but the real work that you put into actually enacting all the things that you are proposing. Um, having that said, I would like to ask my colleague, UN Youth Representative on Sustainable Development for the Netherlands, if there have been any questions online our speakers. Yes, thank you, Ida. Um, it's nice to see that the people at home are also very active. Uh, and there is actually a question from, uh, for Ma Mert from uh, Delsmeer. And the question is, uh, I think you said it is solely a humanitarian uh, crisis or issue. But what do you think about the responsibility towards other organisms, species that are indirect, indirectly impacted uh, by our actions? A very great question. Um, when I say human rights, um, it's of a very human-centered point of view, obviously. But human rights, for example, also include the right to a healthy environment. And when you talk about the right to a healthy environment, ecosystems need to be in balance. So we automatically talk also about animals, about other organisms besides humans that need to be protected, need to be safeguarded. Um, and I think it's also such a human trait to think that we're the center of the universe. I mean, we fought that up until a couple of hundred years ago, literally. Um, 
but we're just a small little um, yeah gear in a massive machine which we call planet Earth, I would say. So you can only be in harmony with that if those other organisms, those other ecosystems are um, at the core of your policy. And we can only influence that because we are the ones who are in, mainly in charge of that. So um, there's no, I would say there's no possible solution in which they don't play a massive role as well. They actually are the most important role players, I would say. Thank you so much. Um, that was the question from online, so uh, everyone who is at home, feel free to uh, to ask the questions. And now it's back to Ida. Maybe I can follow that up um, with a question, because what you're touching on is kind of um, rerouting and rethinking human and nature relationships, right? And maybe um, proposing an ecocentric vision. And that's a vision that indigenous peoples have been living and are continuing to live now. And in our last talk together, you actually also accentuated that 80% of all remaining biodiversity is protected on only 20% of, of our land. And that is being done by indigenous peoples who are only in between three and 5% of our global population. And I think over the last decade, we've seen unprecedented attention being put on that and this finally being recognized. And I think UNEP has played a big role in this. And at the same time, a lot of indigenous peoples are saying the money is not uh, actually being attributed to us. And there's a lot of research that says that less than 1% of all climate and biodiversity funds actually go to indigenous peoples. Um, what's going on here? What's happening at the UNEP level, which also determines and guides countries in where their climate and nature investment should go? So I guess, so thank you, you're quoting exactly the right numbers, right? These are, these, we have these 8 million species, that's all. 8 million on this whole planet, it's not a lot. And numbers tell us, and our analysis tells us, that by 2100, if we continue as we were, we will lose a million species. And the numbers about that on 20% of the land, 80% of the biodiversity, 3% of the people, they're indigenous people protecting this land. Now, much of the resources that have gone to the GF have gone for restoration. Um, so often that is on other lands. Um, and, and clearly empowering indigenous people who pretty much in the only uh, um, convention they have actual recognition in the text of the Biodiversity Convention. They do not have recognition in the text of UNFCCC, although the doors are open, but there's not that explicit recognition in the text. And you will have seen also similarly in the Montreal uh, framework, Global Biodiversity Framework. Getting monies to a people uh, is obviously more complicated than it sounds uh, for all the reasons. This is taxpayers' money, there are audits, there are trails, there's procurement rules and so on. And so often there is an intermediary. Um, and the intermediary would be an NGO, would be a uh, local group that has some ability to have, to have the systems and the structures in place that your taxpayers will demand uh, for resources that might flow. And so there's clearly a need to have a much greater uh, set of intermediaries, but also we need to recognize that why is these numbers maybe so? Not all people, not all indigenous people want this money. This money comes with a lot of additional burden interference, and some just simply want their rights. Stay out, stay away, and secure what are our rights. And so we shouldn't assume that just because the monies don't go there is what actually the people would want. So I think listening closely and understanding uh, where these resources can go where they're wanted and where they are clearly not controlled by an, an agent uh, other than the flow and uh, so that the people themselves can, can uh, manage it. There's a, um, a significant concern also around um, conservation being a, um, an, a, a, con a significant debate that conservation has in the past. If you go back to quote unquote, well not quote unquote, but to the colonial times, you would create a park, you would kick out the people so that white people could go hunting. Right? That was uh, the African experience. And so the experience has been one of exclusion, not of inclusion. So when we do biodiversity work, 
And this is really a respect of where it is. The local people must benefit. And the local people must be in the driver's seat. And that goes for whether it's the Wadden Sea, right here, or whether it's um, some area in, in, in Africa. Making sure that the benefits are not just derived by the state. And that again is difficult, because what do the local people want? You know, and how can those benefits be actually derived to them? The complexity of this is, is massive. Um, if I could just, on, on, the, on the question of, of uh, the previous question, just to mention that uh, there is a movement that has not yet fully arrived, but you know, maybe some people want to have a discussion about it, about the rights of nature. Does nature have an, inalien an inalienable right? Do species have a right as well? And since we all understand the terrible word genocide, it has a very heavy load. It means the extinction of a peoples. Some people are using the word, the word ecocide. In fact, Olof Palme in 1972 at the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment, the conference that led to the establishment of UNEP, used that word. Since that time, it hasn't really been used much, except we see it sort of pop up from time to time. But it is a word that has a very heavy load. Is there, we know under human rights law, there's something called uh, uh, crimes against humanity. Is there such a thing as crimes against the environment? If there is, how are they defined? Today, of course, in human rights law uh, and in the uh, criminal court, they don't exist as rights. But now we have United Nations, uh, United Nations General Assembly gaveling that there is a human right to a clean, safe, and healthy, sustainable environment. Does that then derive other rights and other obligations? It's something that we need to talk about right now. Yeah, it's interesting that you also mentioned in that indeed ecocide, um, we always call them our, our friends at the other court. Uh, in The Hague, we always have the International Criminal Court of Justice, which is where uh, the International Criminal Court, I mean, that's where the ecocide uh, uh, campaigners are working to get it enshrined into that system. And you have the International Court of Justice, um, that's where we are doing our fight for the advisory opinion. Um, so it's two courts with one common goal, which is climate justice. And I think it really resonated with me what you said about uh, how indigenous people and should be viewed as beacons of knowledge as well and sources of of, um, of inspiration on how to actually create future-proof sustainable policies. Um, and when you talk about the rights of nature, for example, I think that these custodians of our planet's final nature, uh, uh, um, like final pieces of nature, these custodians, these indigenous people should take a central stage at conferences. Um, last year in Sharm el Sheikh, which was a very interesting COP, so to say, we had a young indigenous um, activist from Tuvalu, and he spoke to the European uh, commissioner, Frans Zimmermans, about how his island, how his home, is already disappearing. And Tuvalu is, is one of those countries uh, which will disappear. We can already say this with confidence. It's going to disappear. Um, and when he took the stage, he said that we were talking about this for so long. You've never listened. You always ignored our calls. You always spoke about fit for 2030 or 2050 or whatever random date in the future. You hoodwinked us so that we could always have this faith in a solution, but a solution never came. And now you want me to trust you again? There's no more trust. Trust has already been, like, trust uh, leaves by train and arrives on foot, is what they say, right? Well, I'm not sure if that's the correct way for this. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, the idea is good. Um, but it, it goes to show that you can work on these plans and you can work them in back chambers, but in the end, you need people to actually do them and actually be a part of those solutions. And I think right now we owe it to these indigenous peoples to their lands, because don't get us wrong, it's their lands and their history to put them at the forefront, at center stage, and let them be a part of future policies. And my dream is that we as WYCJ can make sure that young people from indigenous communities are at the court talking directly to the judges, 
to those 15 judges that they can speak on their own merits, on our own stories, on our own peoples about what they see as a human rights crisis. Just to give you an idea, the, pr the submissions at the court or the oral submissions at the court are very, very um, uh, important. It gives the judges a clear sight on what is happening in these communities. We don't want to have diplomats with their boring suits talk there about what they think that the climate change is. I'm sorry for the diplomats in the room. Um, no, we want to have young people that are there, that live through this agony, which is the climate crisis. And we ask all of our governments as well to make sure that that can happen. Facilitate that. Be a part of this change. Be a part of this history that we're going to write at the court. Um, so I think that in, in that sense, um, our indigenous brothers and sisters all over, all over the globe are the ones we should use as our source of inspiration. And without them, frankly, would, there wouldn't be anything to protect in the first place. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm wondering whether there's also inspiration to be gathered from, uh, from the people present here. Does anyone have a question? Uh, Merton here, thank you for your uh, interesting discussion. Um, I have a question. Um, it's about not necessarily the UNEP, um, but more on a general societal level. Um, Mert, at some point you said that we need everyone. Um, I think that is a good uh, statement. I think that most people agree in this uh, room with the things that have been discussed during the panel discussion. Um, and sometimes it feels a bit, not trying to be disrespectful, but like we're preaching to our own church. And for example, with the case of the Extinction Rebellion uh, protesters at the highway further down the road, um, some like people that uh, are representatives of the biggest uh, party in the Netherlands, um, a representative recently tweeted that the people there should be locked up. So there, there is this sort of polarization in society, I feel like. And I wonder um, how do we sort of reach out of our bubble and really include everyone in this discussion? I'm interested in your take on that. Great point. Um, also, <laughs> to come back to that tweet which you just mentioned before, uh, I am a lawyer. It, it can't happen. Just <laughs> you're, you're safe. But um, it goes to show that exactly this polarization which we have right now in society, this drift between people which are basically forming one community is exactly what the fossil fuel lobby, what the climate deniers want us to be. They want us to be divided because when you're divided, you're easier to, to control. And what I always use in our arguments to inspire new people to become activists is basically the following things. You and me, even if we have five euros or five million euros, we're still not the ones in charge with the big, insanely obscene amounts of money, power and wealth that control societies. It is those 0.0 percenters that make sure that a lot of decisions are not being made or being taken. So I think we should try to create a discussion. And I agree, this is, a, this is the, the, choir, the preaching for the choir. You're absolutely right. But don't forget, as soon as we're done here, you can all go back to your own homes, communities, friends, families, etc. We all have that one uncle who is probably a climate um, uh, realist, so to say. They'll probably have question marks. Inspire them, talk to them. Don't only talk to people that agree with you. Talk to people that disagree with you. Convince them. And these kind of sessions that we have right now are needed to, to foster and to nurture that movement. And um, th therefore I think that we should see this challenge that we have as uh, the climate crisis is not a thing which is to put people against each other? Absolutely not. I would say work together to create a solution. Back in the 1300s, the Netherlands, we also came together to create uh, governing bodies to, to manage the water flows in the country so we could actually live in this country. They didn't have a discussion back then on if it was a climate change. No, they saw it happening right in front of them, so they managed to do so. And right now we see what the consequences are. Um, the, the North Sea has never been this hot before. Right now, the, the, the average temperature of the North Sea is insanely high. We have El Nino coming up. Those things will actually influence society and on a global scale. So if you want to be ahead of the curve, you need to become the curve. And that's why these people that are currently not a part of it need to be included. And I think this is also a very important point. Um, it's sometimes very elitist, this climate movement that we're in. 
Some terms, and I am also very much guilty of it, when you use abbreviations, when you talk about certain topics, they are very difficult to understand. And I'm not saying we need to dumb things down, absolutely not, because everybody is smart in their own way, in their own capacity. But we need to make it accessible for everybody. Allow them to be a part of the knowledge sets that we have right now. Explain it to them. Make a video, make an explainer, doesn't matter. Start from a very early age. Make them feel included and let them become included. And then you'll prevent politicians who are just le searching for likes on Twitter to, to say, let's say, that lock them up. Um, because I would like to remember people that back in the 70s in the Netherlands, all of the bike paths you see outside, we didn't have them. Uh, people were actually also protesting for them. And right now, I don't see anybody who's against that idea. I think you, from being from Denmark, you also like bicycles. So. <laughs> Very much so. No, and I think um, protesting and speaking up is part of being active. In my youth, it was the anti-apartheid movement and the anti-nuclear movement. Um, and so I think each each time slice has its 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 movement, right? And that's where we were at, and we were protesting and doing things. Now I don't want to see destruction of property and paintings and what have you. I don't think that's clever. This is our heritage, after all, and we don't want that. But sometimes you need to get very edgy to make yourself heard. The secretary general says, you know, power is not given; it is taken. And the mic is not given, it is taken, right? I mean, you, you know, so, so you, not, you need to find where your mic and your power can be uh, gotten from and, and, and then speak out and speak loud and be heard, but, uh, but also make the positive change that you think are needed. And this is where, you know, beyond the activism, living, the, living your values and, and, and the career path that you will take take those values with you in the choices that you make. And I will say it one more time, you have a vote. You are so lucky that you live in a democratic country and that you actually can go and exercise that right at all levels, local, provincial, uh, national, and yes, EU. Do not forsake that vote. There are others who are dying for that right in jails right now, suffering for speaking out, there are women who have been denied that right. We all have it here. Don't squander it. Are there any other questions? Maybe online? There are some questions online also. And there's one question for Inger. Uh, you said that you were once a climate activist yourself, but now you work at the United Nations. So what drives you to do the work that you do and what keeps you motivated and hopeful for this work? I, I hope so. <laughs> I don't think I lost my activist card membership yet. No, so I was recently, not recently, but anyway, at my 40th high school reunion and I had completely completely forgotten what we were up to. And then this uh, school class girl, two of them, they came and said, do you remember the, 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 the <laughs> I came from a very small town in Denmark. Do you remember what we did down on a little town square? I said, no, I don't remember. So apparently they were telling me, so it must be true. And it sort of, this is very much in the, there was a big nuclear power plant right opposite Copenhagen called Basebeck, which was, uh, yes, far away from anything in Sweden, but right close to our capital. And so not particularly um, enjoyable for uh, the population. So at any rate, so we were very active in that movement. And so we had made a, a little demonstration, the three of us, and we were like 17 in the high school square uh, in, 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 in my little, little, little town. Um, so I guess that that spirit uh, is something that, uh, I, because climate change was not a thing, it wasn't a thing. Biodiversity was more known, it was sort of saving nature more than anything else. And then uh, concern about uh, justice, I would say, with anti-apartheid and of course the nuclear question. So I, I, I think that um, keeping the fire in the belly uh, matters, rights matter. Facts matter, and facts, science needs to be understood, and that matters. And that needs to then be understood how you carry it into the law, 
the law is not just something abstract. The law is based on our prevailing understanding of society, society, society societal forces, and science, and what it is that science tells us that is driving us into the ditch, so to speak. And therefore, how do we need to regulate, enable, and in instrumentalize and incentivize that we get on a pathway that will lead to more justice, more inclusion, more fairness, and greater sustainability. Those kind of things have to be what we need to keep. And having then entered the United Nations and working under that blue flag and taken the oath of office, which means that I am forsaking any national influences, nobody can tell me what to do, I will work for science and work for justice. It's a very powerful ideal that the United Nations stands for. And uh, I think that many, many of my UN colleagues, they are forever activists uh, because they firmly believe in the mandate and the mission of the organization. Um, and the biggest activist of them all is our Secretary General. Just listen to his speeches. He is powerful, engaged, inspirational, and committed, and a truth teller, um, and will not let go. He's, I, you're a stubborn optimist. Um, he says, I may not be optimistic, but I am determined. Um, the point being that you can't always, but I like the stubborn optimism as well, but there are times when you know you will get whacked, but you just get determined nevertheless. And these are powerful words, I would say. Absolutely. I think um, whenever you get knocked down, there's another reason to get up every single time. And um, I think that I, I love the example you just said about this small protest of free young people. No, but that, but that's I think the core of the question before when someone said, "What is the activism that you can do? Like, what is it that we can do?" This is the example. Um, I think it can be something very tiny, um, but it eventually, forty years, forty odd years later, people still remember it. So um, I think that in essence, it means that we we tend to think that a lot of our actions are very small and that our choices do not have any influence on, on them, on, on big decisions in the end. But what Inger just said before is, you all have your separate voices. And governments only exist because of the rights that we bestow upon them. And if you make use of your own rights that you have right now, which we're privileged to have, privileged to protect and to carry every single day, then we're also privileged to make sure that we can give this right to our generations afterwards, to the future generations that we might or might not have. Um, and I think that the value in this all is that if you look outside and if you go talk to people that are, for example, living in other parts of the world than ours, um, they understand that the bond with nature has somewhat been disintegrated in the past couple of decades within the Western and European countries especially. But we exist only because nature allows us to exist. We exist only because the bees every single day pollinate millions and millions of, of flowers. So we are not the ones in charge. We're just the ones who are lucky to be alive and lucky to sometimes think that we're in charge. And um, let your activism be an inspiration for others and act so small as like standing on a local city square um, can eventually put you in a seat of power, for example. <laughs> you can grow a movement, right? Just to get back to the fossil fuel subsidy protest, whether you agree with the strategy uh, and, and the ways in which it, it's enacted or not, that started with 10 people on the road and the police cracked down on them very fast and it was dismantled you know, within an hour the first time. Now the seventh time, we saw 6,000 people there and uh, close to 2,000 people willing to risk arrest in order to make a statement, right? Um, I think we should also protest maybe at the International Court of Justice soon, huh? Who knows? We should start it up. I mean, um, you have a question. Yeah, thanks for the uh, presentation or the talks. It was super, super interesting. I was particularly interested by the last comment you guys made on, um, well, I mean, obviously it's about justice and then wealth inequality or wealth equality. And then uh, polluters are often very excessively rich or the rich pollute excessively. Um, and I was wondering, uh, well, for example, in the Netherlands, you also see that the middle class have actually reduced their pollution. And, and uh, so it's not necessarily the same group within every country that reduces or 
uh, pollutes more. But I was wondering, what can you and do <coughs> to cap wealth, for example? Uh, and would that be a solution um, to cap the, like, the, the amount you can accumulate as a person or as a company? Would that be something you can do? And if so, how? I, I'll try to, I think I understand, to cap wealth, was that what you're saying? Yeah, so in the Netherlands we have a basic, like we have a minimum yeah. uh, that people can receive every month or a minimum of, like, or, mm -hmm. or in the donut economy as well, a minimum to live on. Mm -hmm. uh, but do we also need a maximum? So I guess the UN cannot enforce global taxation, uh, however much we might have opinions about that. So these are obviously within sovereign uh sovereign discussions of late so where the UN and and uh, others have moved is sort of uh, corporate wealth tax can you seek tax shelters elsewhere uh, not that doesn't get to your question but that's sort of an area that has had an international governance conversation uh, corporate anti large-scale fraud and corruption and blacklisting of companies is something that the World Bank group as an example will do um, but the the sort of wealth ceiling and 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 is something that some countries through um, progressive taxation enable, not completely. And we can have a discussion about how we can increase the tax. Uh, the that that idea that you will um, to an extent um, bring a, a greater justice by a, a degree of uh, progressive taxation. But the uber rich, the point zero whatever percent, will go somewhere else where there's a tax shelter and will create uh, ways to shield their money that it will be very hard. Companies, shell companies, shell within shell within a shell. Not the shell, but a shell, right? Um, um, companies so that these, uh, they will seek tax shelters. Which is why good tax laws, and again, I go back to it's in your hands on the voting. It's in your hands on the influence that you are. Because these tax laws are not made out of nothing. They are made by politicians who are voted by people like yourselves. Uh, do I think that a, a, a global wealth tax is a good idea? I think it will be nearly impossible to implement amongst 193. But when I look at the injustice between the global north and the global south, and when I look at um, the party, the global party that is going on in the north, and the, I mean, I'm exaggerating here, but there, you may have seen a Greenpeace film that came out recently about this. It's Don't Stop, um, look it up. Um, and it'll just, you'll just enjoy watching that. Um, at any rate, it's a good little video. Um, at any rate, so this, this wealth that we are enjoying in the global north and the extreme cost of living crisis that we are seeing in the global south. And frankly, we saw that inequity and injustice in the vaccines. They were rolled out and all of those who lived in the global north could queue up and get their vaccines and get their second shot and even their third and indeed their fourth, while we in the global north, south, where UNEP happened to be based, were still waiting for the crumbs. And then they would arrive with, oh yeah, you can get this batch of AstraZeneca because it's about to expire. So you have now three weeks to get it injected into people. And then months could pi pass by till we got the second batch. So that injustice, there is a palpable sense in the global south of, of, of that deep injustice from the vaccines, from the global economic order, from the debt crisis that we are seeing. And so there is no wall around any country. They may create one, but the wall will not sustain. And so what we really need to think about is international solidarity, not as an act of charity, but as an act of justice and as an act, frankly, of understanding that we are on this one planet, this one boat together. And so the better we deal with taxation, at least for goodness sake, let's meet the 0 0.7 percent of GDP for, for ODA, right? I mean, that, but that is at the most minimal level. But we often talk about trade, migration, 
and mobility, trade, mobility, and money as being the three things that we have as our toolbox for ODA and so on. So what are the trade rules and are they fair? Are they open? Are they enabling? Are they encouraging? What are the mobility rules for people who no longer can sustain themselves on that particular location? And, and what are the money um, and the market rules? Um, and, and will there be some resources flow to the uh, global south? I think that there's a long way to go. I'm not sure the cap would be the way to do it, but it's a broader conversation that we need to have. That's the best I can do on that question. Thank you. I think the fact that you uh, said the word accumulate is perfect because um, we tend to say earned or earning, um, implying automatically that these uh, individuals uh, have earned their way up to 100 gazillion, trillion, whatever we're talking about, dollars. Um, so accumulate is a very good term. Um, I think from my point of view as WYCJ, we shouldn't talk about, uh, we can't influence this thing because we are focusing on climate policies, for example. But I do agree with one thing which you said. And yes, it's because of this posse of greed um, that we are currently living through crisis. So mentioning, not mentioning uh, the economical situation of the planet and our current economic system will be idiotic. So I need to mention it as a core, root core, uh, root cause of the climate crisis. So absolutely, you can't have a solution for the climate crisis without talking about our current economical um, system. And this linear system that we have right now together with this incentive to continuously grow is the toxic combination, so to say. You can't have eternal growth on a planet that is, well, not eternal, so to say. Um, so absolutely. And if that's a, like a maximized uh, wealth barrier, I'm not sure. I do not know, and I'm not knowledge enough, skilled enough to talk about these things. What I do know is that your um, assessment is correct, and it is indeed with the financial system that we currently have um, that these problems exist and continue to keep on existing. So tackling that should be also absolutely one of our uh, so one of the things that we need to do, um, and I think that they can both um, solidify each other and strengthen each other. And um, <laughs> I think <laughs> someone said once that climate activism without activism is just gar is just gardening or something. So I think that this is also a part of of that. It's it's a broad. Uh, umbrella and this financing and economical uh, elements are definitely under this umbrella as well. So great point. Thank you so much for this question. Thank you and uh, yeah, thank you for the Chico Mendes quote. Environmentalism without uh, class activism is just gardening. Amazing. Yeah, and as an activist farmer, that really <laughs> resonates with me. Um, are there any other questions from the live and online audience? We have one in the front, Kiki. The, the microphone is coming. Okay. Um, well, thank you both for, for being here today and for engaging this, this in this discussion. Um, many of the examples of activism that you mentioned are very individual, and um, they're very inspiring, but it's also often difficult to see how they uh, trickle upwards, if you will. Um, and so my question was uh, or kind of regarding the institutions and institutional changes that we can see that could be positive or inspiring examples. I think the World's Youth for Climate Justice is one such example, um, but I was wondering if you could both maybe uh, illustrate or talk about examples of institutional change or institutions that you think are uh, w w walking the talk, uh, if you will, that inspire you. Um, I think, I, I, I'm not sure, but I think you were talking about sort of larger change beyond a, a person, but sort of large institutions that have taken a stride or a place. You know, um, I think that it's important that we look at, uh, let me see, so obviously you, you see political parties making statements and pushing in, in some direction in spite of political headwinds that they might be against. So that, but I won't go into which and where and so on, that would be inappropriate of me. But maybe what I'll mention is corporate, just because that's not what you're gonna expect me to mention. And so I'll, I'll mention Paul Pullman and Unilever. Um, look, I mean, that, we can talk about Unilever and corporate policies and we can talk about the complexity and the big, bad, large companies, but we all 
users of their products and they are creating hundreds of thousands of jobs and generating income across the world. And then you had at that time a CEO who said, you know what, if I'm measuring myself and if all of my subdivisions of everything that we produce are measuring themselves on the, on the quarterly return, that's a false measure because you can cut the proverbial forest down that quarter and your return will be awesome, right? I mean, the point being that that does not mean necessarily that it's good for long-term business. And so getting that, and, and that's why I, I don't want to vilify folks who step into corporate jobs, because within corporate jobs, there you can be a change agent. And so, you know, shareholders go, hang on a minute, we're not, I mean, you know, we got your share. But the point was that it actually worked. And then he said, I, I, and this was a different conversation a couple of years later, he said, look, why are we putting microplastics in our cosmetics? And we go, well, it's really good, it scrubs the skin, it does all of these things. Well, I don't think it's smart, he goes. So by such and such a year, I forget which, we, we have to exit this from all of our product in the whole Unilever company. And people go, that's it, it's the end of the line because everybody else will do it. There's no legislation that tells us to do it. So how could this possibly be any good? They did it and then it was actually a very interesting point because they could brand it as non-plastic, right? I mean, when you use this product. So I'm not saying everything that every, <laughs> you know, but the point is, leadership and and the and also what you saw in that company was that all of a sudden workers got a little you know we are we are not just the bad corporate we are actually doing something really interesting here so the point being that leadership and and shifts that you can see can be very large and very brave or Inger on the town square with two of her, <laughs> her girlfriends uh, at age 17 so um, so I am inspired by Paul. He's now retired, he's no longer in the company, he's doing other things, he's spending his time on doing good, he's set up any number of foundations. I saw him recently in Kenya where he's supporting um, um, uh, uh, schools for the blind, I mean just doing all kinds of awesome work uh, himself. Um, and so, um, but I think that that kind of corporate leadership, as an example, um, and I very much hope that the new CEO will carry it forward, and I think shareholders have an understanding now uh, that this actually means something. Um, and so if that's a way that we can see real leadership, now we see legislation following. Okay, we can get this uh, microplastics out of our, okay, good, let's do that, right? So I think, the kind of leaders that we need to see in all walks of life, from the commercial sector to the business sector, etc. Those new startups with a mom and pop kind of startup that starts on renewables um, and starts on innovations. Um, there's a company in, in Kenya, it's called Mkopa, um, and it was a company that thought, look, because Kenya has leapfrogged into the um, uh, they were very the first to have uh, cell phones and to have mobile money, the first in the world, um, as have cell phone mobile money. Um, the others have now followed through, but they had it some 17 years ago. At any rate, so but then they wanted to reach the unbanked, and so they thought we've got to have a company that can uh, give people the money to buy a cell phone, and then they thought, but anyway, people don't have electricity. So Mkopa got funded, got established. Just a small company, but now it's big, but at any rate, so they will give loans to a little household that the house can buy one solar panel and pay off the $1,000 for the solar panel over a 10-year period, which would cost the same as your electricity bill. That's super inspiring, um, and so on and so forth. So these were just some examples. What do you have? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's a very good point. And coming to institutions and so, uh, institutions they obviously exist out of people as well, right? And um, in order to get that change in an institution, in a board, uh, I think Paul Pullman is a great example as well. Um, it starts out with acknowledging that certain things can be done uh, on a 
on a small scale. And I think um, institutions are prone to changes in a society and they can only exist due to the fact that society allows them to exist. So in a way, this natural progression that needs to be taking place uh, can be taking place on, from, from either the inside out, influenced by the inside out, or the other way around. And obviously what we're seeking is that we are doing it from the outside in. So uh, institutional change starts out in the streets or I'm not sure if that's me. Um, um, it starts out in the streets. So if you want to make sure that uh, you change these institutions from the inside out, um, you need to have activists everywhere. You need to have them influence every single spot where you could possibly do so. And in that way, we might be the most transparent secret organization ever because we're trying to get as much members as possible to be uh, uh, proudly saying that they're activists and that they're campaigners for our cause. And it would be amazing to see, for example, that you have someone who's a cleaner or someone who's a head of state, both part of the same campaign, both part of trying to protect the planet, both understanding their position, their role, and seeing that they work together to achieve um, sustainability, for example, or sustain sustainable goals. So institutional changes only exist due to the fact that we allow these institutions to exist, and their entire right to exist comes forth out of, out of um, the, the way that we make them and, and form them. So uh, I think that in the interest of most of these institutions that we currently have, it is for them also to change and to adapt themselves in a way, we're going back to adaptation, <laughs> to adapt into a way that they could continue on forward their work, I would say. So um, yeah, in order to be, in order to remain relevant, you need to stay relevant, and a relevance can be found in whatever happens outside of their own small bubbles. Uh, I want to ask a small follow-up question that's actually secretly or openly secretly very big and then I will give the floor to one last question from the audience. Um, I think you both gave very insightful answers to the question but I did interpret it uh, maybe a little bit differently and so maybe to add on to that, you, know, you said you've been around for a while and you've taken up very important positions in many different institutions that play a big role in global governance. And so I'm wondering, in relation to climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution, what developments have you seen over the past decades? What are the big institutional and systemic changes that you've seen? Maybe, um, maybe there's one big trend that you've that that you can call on to kind of give an example of of how change happens. Well, on, uh, I think that there is a realization that with eight billion people, we can't continue as we were. And so that's sort of, the, and so whether it's the UN or I spend time in the World Bank or in IUCN or in UNEP where I now am, um, I think that there's an understanding amongst uh, when I deal with decision makers that yesterday's paradigm doesn't work for today, let alone for tomorrow. There's a huge push, uh, hold back, you know, there's sort of forces that are, no, 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 please let us not change because we are in our comfort zone, corporate-wise, system-wise, wealth-wise. We don't want to be, you know, let's just stay as we were. But I think when we're seeing that right now we're sort of one-to-one -one on the investments in, in, in clean and green on the energy side and investment in, in not clean and green, i.e. in fossil fuel, dirty, that's in a one-to-one. -one. What will it look like to take it to a four, to one, and four, to zero? You know, what does that look like? Um, I think that we are seeing that prices have dropped tremendously. On biodiversity, it's still a struggle. It's a struggle in this country, and it's a struggle in many places, because um, we still need to eat. And our food systems are geared to operate in a certain manner. And making those levers shift uh, chemical intensive agriculture. Um, we started out with a meat question. You know, making the shift is is harder. Turning the light on, and I sort of okay, wherever the, it came from, it's okay. But my daily routines about how I operate and my interaction with with uh, with food systems is is harder to change. But even there, we're seeing significant changes. On the pollution and waste, we have huge issues on air pollution in this part of the world. 
uh, and significant issue. I mean, obviously, nitrogen in this country is a big, big conversation. But there is an understanding that we cannot continue to live without toxic sludge, and that we cannot that that toxic tra trail that humanity leaves behind is just not possible when we are eight billion. I mean, when we were a couple of billion, it still shouldn't have been possible, but we didn't notice it as much, and we didn't breathe it in as much, and we didn't live with it as much. But today, an unborn child has has plastic and PFAS in their bodies, right? I mean, it's just, a, it's in the placenta of mothers. In, it's in 97% of European drink, drinking water. Uh, not PFAS, but nanoplastic. So we breathe it in from the carpets around us, from the air, from the dust, from our clothing. It's very real. So I think there is an awareness around each of these. It's just too slow. It's just not fast enough which is why supporting, pushing, uh, speaking out, taking to court, doing what needs to be done, getting active, is the only way forward. And it's hard, and it's tiresome, and it's irritating, and can, can make you angry, but it should also make you celebrate the wins that we have when a big thing happens. Like we gaveled in Montreal, the global biodiversity framework. This is huge. And we're watching right now what will happen in the EU um, because it matters and matters greatly if the EU aligns to, with its nature restoration law, the global biodiversity targets. It's a big one. And so that's why I've been very outspoken on that one too. Uh, it's not over yet, but we'll have it in the next week or so. But that will matter and matter greatly too. I'll keep it very brief, I think. Um, just to add on, I think it's, you're absolutely right. You need to foster that idea of making sure that we can all become a part of this activism that we want to see. And from my point of view, from our point of view as WYCJ, I would say um, we need to make sure that we hold the people in power accountable. Our governments need to be held, held accountable too. And that can only be done if we understand what our tasks are. And our task is making sure that we have a livable plan for the foreseeable future, making sure that we are a part of this international processes. I want to see people that are here today at the court, inside of the court, talking with stakeholders, talking with their governments on what they want to see included in those submissions. I want to see you guys together with us, together with people from all walks of life, work together on a sustainable plan and a sustainable future. So we can finally see that climate justice is human is, is, is also like a human rights justice fight, so to say, but also a fight that we can find common grounds in because we want to do it together. I think that's a, a perfect answer to the question behind me that we will end on. Can we fight pollution, biodiversity loss, and climate change? I think it's an, a full body, determined, strong, <laughs> yes. We can, we must, and we will. Thank you. <laughs>